Good morning, everyone. Thank you for starting the day out with me. Now, if there's anyone who knows just how true the saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is, it is my first guest this morning, Chuck Meyer. He has gone through trials, gone through tribulations, had his leg blown off, saw it all in Iraq. Despite all of that, though, this man has a grin on his face from ear to ear and always has such a positive attitude. It's always fun being able to talk with you, Chuck. And I have to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you are great, Chuck. And I, I just love your attitude is what I love. And now for our viewers who aren't familiar with what happened to you, Chuck, you were a security contractor in one of the most dangerous spots during the Iraq war. How did you end up as a security contractor there? Um, I was chasing the dragon, I guess. Uh, it's, a, it's a terminology we use. I was prior military, did combat search and rescue, fell out of helicopters and saved people's life in the Navy. And after the Navy, I went to the fire department and uh, that just didn't have enough oomph for me. And then I became a police officer in the Florida Keys, or sheriff's deputy in the Florida Keys, worked with the SWAT and the dive team down here, and was basically still looking for that big time camaraderie team concept that I had when I was in the military. And uh, I got the opportunity from a friend of mine, called me up and asked me if I wanted to do professional bodyguard, private security contracting in Iraq. And the paycheck was right. So the lure of the big money paycheck when you go from making thirty grand a year with the sheriff's department to, you know, a hundred plus, it's a pretty easy choice to make. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the risk versus reward is is out there, but mm -hmm. that's the stuff I did anyway. So that's how I got into it. And uh I enjoyed it. I lived in Iraq all over the place from Baghdad, Ahila, Carabella, Fallujah, Tikrit, um, Badouche, any anywhere you could name that had a military base on it, we went there. Mm -hmm. And one of the best jobs that I had, not to mention I was doing, I felt like I was doing something for my country again. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the patriotic part of me got fulfilled there too. Absolutely. You know, I was doing something that meant something, mm -hmm. not getting cats out of a tree mm -hmm. you know that that to me just didn't fulfill my needs mm -hmm. well you got your needs fulfilled there and oh. it was a very very dangerous job and one of the things that happened to you chuck you got your leg blown off yeah october 11th at 11 11 a.m iraqi time i hit a ied and um suffered a traumatic injury double compound fracture of the right tib fib and uh basically had my lower part of my leg sitting in my crotch uh it was a unique moment at the very best, I guess. It was a, to, to describe it, it's really hard to describe because I rode 155, you know, pounds of TNT, basically, um, and limped away from it. Had some very good friends, and that's, you know, the definition of a very good friend. Somebody will come to get you after you got blown up. That's a brother. That's somebody who'll take care of you. Uh, come and remove me and my partner from a vehicle. And um, one of one of our teammates actually stepped on the second IED and didn't make it through. His name was Jerry. Uh, his call sign was Dog. And he, he died that day. But he gave his life to save one of ours. And that, again, the ultimate sacrifice that anybody can make is, you know, that's the love, that's a, that's a bond of brotherhood that normal people don't get to experience, look at, or know. Well, th that's so true. They don't. They right. don't get to get to know what that that is like. Now, Chuck, when you came back then to the United States, you had one leg at the time. Were you a happy-go-lucky guy, or were you a little down at this point? Oh, absolutely not. Um, we tried to save. We tried to save the leg. Um, the first six, you know, the first four, five, six months. I kept it and I was determined to say, well, I'm going to keep this leg because I'm a mutant and I can, I can will it to function and work properly. And uh, unfortunately, that's, that wasn't the plan. Um, because of my height, my weight, the type of injury that I sustained was a, po was a uh, blast injury. Um, even the reconstruction leg, my body did heal. I rebuilt bone over the tib-fib and 
it was, you know, hard, structural type bone. The problem with that theory is it went over and covered the ankle. So every time that I would take a step and walk, I would effectively break my leg again. Um, I was taking pain pills, uh, eating them like Skittles. Uh, it was the most depressed I've ever been in my life. I can remember times that I would wake up, see the sunshine, and cry to the point of almost, you know, suicidal. What am I doing? Why am I, do why am I doing this? How am I going to make this? My wife, our girlfriend at the time, she coached me through it, and, you know, she, I'd never done drugs before. I didn't know the effects of it, and I was on Flexeril, Darvacet, Laura Tabs, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, you name it, we just put it in a thing and made a cocktail out of it, and that's what I, I had every two or three hours to subside the pain, to beat the pain. I made the physical decision to have my leg removed after, you know, after seven months, and that was probably one of the better decisions that I made because the pain went away automatically. And then it was dealing with, okay, now you have one leg, how are you going to drive on after that? You're still living, you're still breathing, it's bills still got to be paid, get off your butt and take care of business. You have a family to support and deal with. And you know, I would always remember the old peg leg pirates with the, you know, the wooden legs. These are some real hard guys. Because mm -hmm. if you're back in the 1800s and you're missing a leg, you don't have the prosthetics that we do today. Right. They stuff a burlap sack in there and you know, strap a couple of straps on it and still ambulated or motivated around and completed a job and lived. And I'm like, I live in, you know, 2003 to 2006, you know, seven, eight, nine, currently. Mm -hmm. And I think about what people had to do in the old days and the advances that we have today. There's no reason that you can't get up and move. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you just made yourself, you, was that the moment when you just, when you thought back on that, when you had the leg amputated, you just made that decision that, hey, I'm gonna get up every morning, I'm gonna live and I'm gonna enjoy this life that I've been given. Um, the initial decision actually came during the time of the uh, the IED attack, during the time of the explosion. My partner was with me, and he was telling me in five different languages that we were going to die. And uh, I simply looked at him and said, I've got shit to do. I've got a daughter. I've got a wife, you know, back home. I'm not going to die in this sandbox. They're not going to kill me. If I was going to die, we wouldn't have this conversation. That's it. Now you can suck this up, and we're going to drive on. He too made it. You know, he had uh, he lost his right upper arm, and they reattached that with cadaver bone, put it on there. Still talk to him every once in a while, mm -hmm. and um, you know he made it another another positive thing. And I just had to basically slap him into existence. Like, mm -hmm. if you're going to die, do it now. Just give up. Mm -hmm. If not, quit talking about it. Mm -hmm. We've got stuff to do. There's people coming to get us. There's people risking their lives because we know there's another IED out here. That's the mm -hmm. That's the operation that these guys do. They get the first one, and then the second one gets the people who come in and rescue you. So these guys are coming to save us. If you want to die, I'll call, off, call them off and tell them you're dead, and I'll crawl out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Changed his mind, and we both made it. You know, um, that, that was the initial motivating factor, I guess, or the initial thing that I did to, to drive on. And from that point, it became easier. Now, there was peaks and troughs. Uh, I'm not going to tell you, yes, I've been motivated the whole time. Mm -hmm. That's a level of BS that nobody's going to even take or buy. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's painful, and you have to work through it. Mm -hmm. You just have to, you have to realize if you can take it at its least, most tiniest form, I'm breathing air. I just had a hot dog. I can go out and get on the boat and feel the sunshine on my face. I can move from point A to B, point B. I'm doing okay. You are. I have the ability to continue that. Mm -hmm. I'm not dead yet. Mm -hmm. It's but, the simple things that, yes. we, that we need to pr appreciate and sometimes we forget about those simple things. You can read all about Charles' experience in Iraq and Afghanistan by picking up a copy of his book, The Letters from the Sandbox. It is so fun to have you here on the show. Thank you. It's fun to be here. <laughs> Never change, all right? <laughs> I'm trying not to. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't, and I look forward to having you back again. Well, today. anytime you want, you just give me a call. I'll come out and show up. All right. I'm going to take a quick break right now. There's much more to come this morning. Stay with me.